another session of deploying yourself. Um, this is session four. We have worked together for a month and uh, I hope that what we are going to do today and what we will continue to uh, will be, you know, another beginning time for you to actually start deploying yourself. I'm really excited to, uh, to have had this class with all of you and I just want to say before we go and jump into the content that I want you to have my contact information in case you know you're using this stuff and something happened to you you want to complain to me I'm excited to be on the other side and to hear what you have to say so it's adrianopianesi.com this is my personal email and deploying yourself was the class that we have taken together well I you know you have been so far almost finishing the deck so I want to propose a new combination of cards. Uh, you have this deck so you can do it on your own. If you put those cards together, bandwidth, purpose and source of energy, you have, you know, three key concepts that we have discussed. You remember bandwidth, our use of time, purpose, what is the overarching, overarching sense of direction and the source of energy, whether or not you are um, motivated by meaningfulness, progress, competence or choice and you know as you put those cards together a questions come up here and that question is what are ways to sustain my work for change this is really the the theme of those three cards how can where do you find the energy the purpose the bandwidth the time the resources the interest for this work and, you know, if we put together three other cards, the three circles, the new capacity and the repertoire, you are then able to kind of deal with a different kind of situation. We will talk about the three circles today and what legacy practice I need to let go. What new capacity are required for this moment? What is required? How can I increase my repertoire? And then we have, of course, the conversation that we had last week about role and self about the default, about our loyalties, the past, that keep influencing our present, especially when we deploy a role. And the question there could be, what loyalties do I need to refashion? Because they're no longer, they need to be updated, or they're no longer helping me in what I am dealing with right now. So this, those were all the cards that we discussed up to this point. Uh, the, today we're going to add these cards and that will close the deck. Um, as you see, the deck is completed with those extra six cards that we're going to discuss today. And I'm interested in today's session because I want to talk to you about, you know, a, a, a story. I want to tell you a story. Um, and you may know these stories, but, you know, it's one that I... I like a lot uh, and it's a story about uh, two fish um, there are two young fish swimming along and they happen to me an old fish and uh, the old fish look at them and say good morning boys how is the water and the two fishes look at each other and they ask what the heck is water now I like this information and this stories because I think it talks about something much deeper than a skill. It talks about a mindset, an established set of attitudes, an outlook almost, a way to look at life, uh, a frame of mind, an attitude, a disposition, a way of being, but also what's around it. And you know, this is not fixed. I mean, we know that mindset is actually not fixed. Think about when you wake up in the morning. What is your mindset if you're not a morning person? Or think about your mindset when you're going on vacation. I mean, it's almost like two different completely versions of you and who you are. And yet, today we want to talk about that. We want to talk about how do you show up. How This has nothing to do with what is around you. But it has to do more with you at a deeper level, almost at a level of being. So the question, I'm talking about a state of being in the world. I'm not talking about an opinion or being optimistic or pessimistic or being in a good mood or in a bad mood. I'm talking about, about how all these things color and influence your way of being in the world, your way of dealing with others. 
And I have a very simple tool to offer to analyze and understand this otherwise very esoteric concept. And the, and the tool I have to offer is a simple line. It's um, a simple tool for understanding and deploying yourself. It's a simple black line. At any moment, you're either above the line or below the line. And our location describes mostly how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. Uh, how we show up. What is our way of being? Now, if we are above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we're normally closed, we're not curious, and we're committed to being right. Um, now, stop for a moment and just think, where are you right now? Are you above the line or below the line? Now, this is an interesting conversation because, you know, you may be in this situation right now, but you may not be where it was at the meeting you are today in Zoom, where you have a call with somebody, or maybe even when you woke up or when you had lunch. So typically, people below the line, they believe certain things and about the world. For example, they believe that, um, you know, um, that there is not enough time, for example, or that there is not enough money, or that there is not enough energy or enough love. So there is a focus on what is not enough. And uh, um, below the line, people believe, believe that their story about the situation uh, is right. And they believe that also that there is a threat out there and, uh, and is threatening their desire for approval, for control or for security. And people below the line see the world as very serious. And the deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line also behave certain way as well. They tend to cling to opinion and they tend to believe uh, a set of belief. For example, that what's happening is about me or that it's about being rational. It's about being justified, protecting yourself, or avoiding conflict, or it's about pursuing conflict. And it's and all this normally is for the sake of winning. Now, when people are above the line instead, and this is a very different situation, they're more open to learning and to growth. Um, people above the line normally uh, they consider old people and old circumstances as allies, places where there is something you can learn. Uh, and uh, they normally are reeling in curiosity and they are normally believing a different set of thing, that the world is about listening deeply, uh, that it's about discovering what you do not know, that it's about questioning belief that you do have, and it's about living a happy life. And that it's about, you know, I, I want to say something because, you know, I don't want to simply point out uh, a differentiation that is one is good and one is bad. I want to say that it's absolutely normal to be below the line. We are actually hardwired to go below the line uh, because our brain perceives threat. And when it does, uh, literally, there is a chemical cocktail in our veins that, you know, bring us below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive real threat, very real threat. So in a sense, it's completely normal to be below the line. But what I'm trying to point out here is that this brain, the brain that used to serve us so well in situation where we have to run away, is no longer serving us that well. Because when we are below the line, we are we can tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or to our identity. And we react, we get defensive and we stay below the line. Now, below the line, we are not in a state where we can use creativity, collaboration, innovation, connection. Uh, we're simply trying to survive. So we have a different operating system. And I don't want this uh, brief slide to just suggest that being below the line is not a human experience. 
Uh, it's a human experience that comes from our life and from our evolution, and it's a human experience that has served us well, that serves us well in some circumstances. What I am observing is that it's not helping us in the circumstances of deploying ourselves for change. So I want to clarify this because I don't want to just give you, you know, a very generic idea here. So again, I'm going to ask you for a moment, where are you? Above the line or below the line? And I ask you this question asking you in the moment when you normally deploy yourself. Are you concerned about what's happening to you or, or are in an eye level of creativity and collaboration? You remember this graphic when we started and saying that the now moment it's all we have and that the inner work of deploying ourselves cannot compete with the outer work because they happen together. And so does our being in the world. When we are above the line or below the line, this is nothing more than a tool to suggest that you, that you think about some ideas. And you answer question like, what is the quality of your attention and focus wherever you are being? Uh, while you're being, what is it that you're doing? Now, this seems question there seems very esoteric, but you know, I really would like for you to believe that what I'm asking you is not philosophical, it's very practical. It's really how you show up in a meeting. Besides what's happening in the meeting, is all that complex element of expectations, attitude, your level of energy, what you believe about people, what you believe about the situation. What does being mean for you? What obstacle do you encounter that distract you from being, from being there? And, you know, another question is, what are some ways in which other as and at being there for you? And, you know, those questions, what's the difference between being present and being fully present? I mean, at the end of the day, what I'm discussing here is a quality of being that has to do with the quality of your attention, the quality of your purpose. Everything focused in the moment. It's a state of being that it's essential in a course like this, because as you understand from our conversation before, we have discussed that that moment is really all you have. So paying attention to how you show up in that present time, in the present moment, not an opinion or a mood, but a general state of being in the world is important. Now, why we're talking about uh, this these ideas? Because I believe that in the work that we're doing, uh, what I am inviting you since the beginning of this class has been a powerful experience of yourself. And that's the most important experience from where all other experience come from. And if we're talking about deploying yourself in the world for change, we need to be clear about how do we have the experience of ourselves, which of course have a direct impact on the experience of all the other experience, including the one of deploying yourself. So this is not a list of think about uh, our thinking about yourself or possible explanation of why we are this way or not. This is a, simply an invitation to be aware and intentional about how we show up for ourselves and from others. And, you know, this is so interesting because if you think about it, a lot of the work of change, a lot of the work that we're discussing here is work that take place above the line. Adaptation, growth, change. It's work that happens above the line. And what's happening below the line is being right, is protecting ourselves from losses for what we can, might lose, for what might no longer be there for us. And so above and below, I think it's a critical tool in the present time to realize how you're showing up. And how is this showing up, of course, influencing everything about my deploying myself in the moment. But it's also an occasion for us to discuss to a critical concept about change, the concept of loss. Uh, this is a, an incredibly important topic, which I would say makes a big difference between who we are and what do we want to change. We don't have a lot of respect 
for the pain of losses. Change makers do not have a lot of respect for the pain of losses. The truth is that nobody throw away a lottery ticket or a new car or a new baby. So people don't hate change. I disagree with that idea. People don't hate change. People hate losses. People hate losses and because they hate losses, we need to be as change maker very aware of what this concept means for ourselves at the individual level and for the people that we are involved in our change. Because often, even if we don't realize it, our change is bringing losses to people. Even if it's the most perfect and great idea in the world, even if our purpose is to be more effective, efficient, to save money, increase market share, become the number one, every change brings losses to people. And having this idea clear in your mind is really essential. Just think for a moment about the conversation that we have had up to this point. Well, last week we talked about the ability to see ourselves clearly, but also the ability to see in ourselves what we can't see, as we discussed about, we talked about blind spot. And I ask you that question about what's the one thing that you hear consistently for people about yourself that irritates you. I mean, think about that question. Chances are that if you were to address that question, you were to, ad to address four different losses. The losses of who you think you are, uh, which was nothing more than the authenticity paradox we talked before. The, lows, the losses of your loyalties. You have learned to be the boss from, a, from somebody that you deeply respected. Now your level of being the boss is no longer adequate for the situation. Deal with that moment means renegotiating their loyalties, which you are afraid to lose. You feel like you lose your core values because you have to now do interject personal elements in the presentation and you are the person that goes by the number. Or you feel that you're losing your current repertoire. You're no longer okay with what you already know. You are losing little pieces of your identity, of who you are. If you think about it, the work we have been doing in the last few weeks has been nothing more than an attempt to deal with those losses. Because every change is nothing more than an attempt to deal with losses. And so think about it. Think about those losses that happens in everybody's life. Um, you might feel you're using your identity, your faithfulness to your loyalties, for example. You may feel that a special change might actually make you lose your competence. You don't know what to do anymore in your job. You knew, you knew the procedure, you knew who to talk to. Now that's no longer true. You lose your comfort. You don't do that with, no, with closed eyes anymore. You have to now really think and relearn it. Loss of security, reputation, time, money, power, and ultimately, you know, resources, independence, righteousness. You're no longer the one that is always right or even your job, and then ultimately your life in some extreme cases. So losses, it's really a critical concept, but it's also a concept that I wanna say is very positive. I mean, think about your life. Think about your past you and your present you. I mean, in case number one, your past you is completely different than your present you. The past me is completely different than your present me. In the case of number six, your past me is the same of your present me. That means not a lot of changes have happened. Now, I am really curious to ask you this question now. I would like for you to tell me, where are you? One, two, three, four, five, or six. One, you have completely changed. Who you are today is completely different from who you used to be. Six, who you are today is exactly what you used to be. So very curious if you can enter in your chat. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, or six? I'm really curious. Well, three, I receive a three, four, two, one, four. I mean, this is incredible. Five, uh, two, four, three. I mean, we got a lot of very interesting number here. I'm inviting you to think about this slide because if you think about it, 
the difference between your past me and your present me is losses. It's something that you have lost. Yes, you have gained something as well, but your past you used to be different. And that's the reason why losses is a critical concept. We can say, reversely, that your present me is equal the past me plus growth. And that growth is the reverse of those losses. And we can also say that growth equal nothing more than your present me minus your past me. So there are a lot of things that have happened. And, and that's the reason why I do feel that this concept is really critical to, for our work together. Loss is about growth and change. And we know that the tool of above and below, it reveals how our way of being if it manages loss as well. And that is the reason why I think that this conversation is a conversation that is deeply connected to the work of adaptation that we are working, uh, that we are dealing with in this class. Think about it. We started this course talking about the fact that we live in adaptive times. And I think that the last two years in the pandemic have demonstrated in very radical term that the world that we have known is different by the world that we are moving to. Now, the issue here is if we are clear about this slide, we're also clear that this transition cannot be without losses cannot be without us dealing with those losses in some kind of way. And, you know, we may have different opinion. We may say that what was is, you know, continue to be, you know, a lot in today's. Or we can believe that is more like this, that what was is 90% of what it is today. Or we may have this idea or maybe this idea. Whatever is the idea, what was is not 100% of what will be. And the difference is losses. So the ability to deal with this concept and to actually understand that this concept is absolutely central to our development and to our growth give us not only the great resource to do this work individually well, learning how to deal with losses, how to actually mourn the part of ourself that we, that is changing and that we're losing. But also it equipped us with an incredibly powerful tool when we ourselves are asking people to change because what we are doing to them is nothing more than ask them to sustain losses. And this is a radically different way that bring you much automatically a different way of being when you're actually deploying yourself for change. And it forces you to rethink, to rethink a lot of ways in which you are actually moving forward. For example, almost, and now we're talking about a way of thinking, uh, it forces you to, let's say, emphasize different skills from the one that maybe you have emphasized in the past when you were deploying yourself, is learning to listen and to observe better. And I guarantee you, I do this exercise in class often. I ask people to read something and then to tell me what they read or see a situation and listen to somebody talking. It's really, really hard to truly listen well. Learning to not believe everything we think. This is an incredibly powerful statement because naturally our brain is led astray by what we think and without need of proof. Learning to hold our certainties lightly. Realize that we live in a changing world. Learn to develop extraordinary humility. Uh, learning to unlearn. Learning to ask better questions. Learning the art of the good fight, of the fight that is really important for us. Learning to deconstruct our own biases or learning to be more playful with ourselves. 
This is a very important idea. Now, how will we become more playful with ourselves? I mean, a way to do it is to realize how do we make sense of the world. We make sense of the world, we talk about this, making sense of the world. Now, this is simply about making sense of the world. It's not so much our state of being. We talked about this before. There is a set of observation which we want to enlarge. There is a set of interpretation that we have about the world. And then, of course, we get into action. We do things. We attempt to make change or to create impact. Now, the important part here is that at the level of the interpretation is where we need to actually enlarge our capacity. For a lot of different things that we have discussed before, last week we talk about complexity, we talk about the balcony, this place where we can entertain more interpretation than the one that we have now. Now my question is, if we are meaning-making machines, inevitably what happens if we are meaning-making machines is that we have experiences. And I don't know if that has ever happened to you, but we're making sense of whatever capacity we had at the time. Uh, as a child, you have experiences. For example, as a child, you grab a hot pot and off the stove and, you know, very quickly you realize that you get hurt and that it was dangerous. So there is a set of experience that happens to us. And those sets of experience are positive, some are negative, and as life continues, and we collect, continue to collect those experiences through this mechanism of observing, interpreting, and acting, we, the reaction to what happened to us create a set of belief, of vows, of norms. For example, do not touch the, the hot pot of the stove, because you get, you get burned. So we protect ourselves. We put ourselves in a position not to be hurt again. And that means that we, there is a series of algorithm. When this happens, do this so that you don't go into this trouble. And do not do this when you are in this situation. I mean, really in very simple terms, believe vows, norms that come from our own direct experience, from our loyalties, from a set of experiences that we have had from which we have learned something. Now. Here is the interesting part of this. We create almost kind of a protective system. And there is nothing wrong because this internal self-protection system becomes a self-protector is teaching us and holding us to be safe. If we have traumatic experience, we have given a lot of power over to this self-protector. And they are almost sometime running the show much more than we are. For instance, imagine the typical thing that I see in many of my classes, the professor that humiliated you when you were young and told you that you didn't know how to draw. How to draw. Well, that professor put you in a position to create a new belief system and the self-protection is internalize the fact that you don't know how to draw. And you, will not, you are not the artistic type. And, you know, this is an example. So we want to be safe. But the question here is, how do we engage with danger, growth, and loss in a way that is compatible with our growth? We start to enter this place where we need to be in this equilibrium. And the equilibrium become an ally for some time if we have to deep desire to keep ourselves safe. Part of what I think is, the real issue is, how do we upgrade? You know, the real question to ask is, we need an upgrade of our self-protection. In other words, we need to rethink our self-protection in order to grow. And that is the key concept that I would like to share with you. This self-protection mechanism, it's a powerful create a powerful immunity against change that happened to us. In other words, we are becoming immune to change because we are being protected by our own belief system, our own assumption about life as it has happened to us. For example, we believe that we are not creative 
And therefore, we're not putting ourselves in a position where we can disconfirm that belief. This self-protection system, because we were shamed in the past, is telling us, don't say that you know how to draw so that you will avoid shame again. And this is a situation where you avoid situation where you can develop that capacity. And that lack of capacity then will continue to confirm your belief that you're not creative. So, being a human being is not a very safe endeavor. It's filled with uncertainty and even in the best times, um, there are unknown dangers perceived and real and imagined and some are very real. So the question here to ask is, as adults, as people trying to change and grow and deploying ourselves better, it's important for us to reflect how have I historically kept myself safe? And, you know, the first step to do this work is to identify your improvement goal. I mean, you know that we don't have time to go through the process of the immunity to change, which is a very elegant process developed at the School of Education at Harvard um, that bring you towards the edge of an assumption which is a, an assumption that clearly you have created for yourself and is keeping you stuck where you are. But what I can do is ask you at least to share with me in this session, what is your improvement goal? I mean, you remember that from last week, I asked you to identify an improvement goal. I would love for you to take this first step in the immunity to change in identify your improvement goal, the one that I ask you to define last week for yourself. And this being the first step in detecting your immunity to change. Now, this is very powerful at the personal level for you in this class, but it's also powerful in at the organizational level because not only individuals have immunity to change, also organizations have immunity to change. You know, a, an interesting an interesting conversation comes to mind when we talk about this, and that is, you know, that um, interesting quote from Orson Welles, who was saying that in Italy for 30 years under the Borgia, uh, they had warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. And in Switzerland, they had brotherly love, 500 years of democracy and peace, and they they produce the cuckoo clock. So I love this quote, besides the obvious reason, but also because I, what I'm trying to point out here is that hardly there is ever creative growth from absolute peace and staying home. In my classes, I often say that to be creative, you need to believe home. And when I say home, I mean your default, what you're normally doing the actual uh, routine that you're normally following. And so my question to you is very simple. What is your improvement goal? Let's see if you can write it in the chat. And this is a critical step in your work of deploying yourself, because in your improvement goal, you're telling to the world, you know, I want to make this change happen, but in order for me to be able to do it, I need to become better at doing this. And this is totally up to you. So this is not, oh my gosh, my boss doesn't promote me. I want to be promoted. Well, in order to be promoted, what do you become, need to become better at? So it needs to be depend. Megan, thank you. Thank you very much. Very important improvement goal. Very important improvement goal. Very important, Brenda. Oh my gosh, your improvement goal are awesome. That it's almost never the case. Wow. Delegate more. Non-neglect. Fantastic. Listen, become, this is incredible. I mean, your improvement goal are ready to go. I mean, normally when I do those classes, that's not always the case. I like that what you're defining here is really powerful. And you know, another step, and, I, and I'm, I'm really grateful for your hard work in doing this. I know that that's not that simple. So an important step here, I think that really you need to, uh, to give a look is, you know, about the continuum 
about this goal. Now you have defined your goal. Now it would be really important if you could actually use the continuum of progress. This is an example from a commitment or improvement goal of David. David wanted to be better at increasing the number of things to delegate to people in order to have fewer things on my plate. David identified this as a major commitment or improvement goal in order to actually become better at reaching whatever he wants to do. As you see, David has identified a first step forward, has identified a significant progress, and what is success? So this is very realistic for David. David is not talking about this in the abstract. I, in the slide that I will send you, you will see at this link a PDF file with an empty continuum of progress so that you can actually take the time to develop your own and actually bring about that change in more clear step. How does the first step forward look like? How does this significant progress look like? How does success look like? Those are important questions to answer. Now, I am really excited because I'm about to show you the most important slide of this class. And so I don't know what to say because it is really a key slide, which I think is going to rock uh, a little bit of the world of those of you that, you know, tend to think of leadership in terms of, you know, you plan everything, and then you jump into action when everything is planned and realized. And what I am telling you to do instead with this more experimental mindset is deploy yourself exclamation point. And that is really is nothing more than an invitation to act and then think, which is a radical inversion that I'm asking you to, to sustain and to think for the sake of truly become the person that you want to become. And the reason here is that you have to start before you're ready. You have to begin before you have clarity. Because the misunderstanding here is that action is not done after we figure everything out. Action is not done after we figure everything out. Hold on a moment on the most important part of this. Oh my gosh, here we go. Action is not um, done after we figure things out. Action is a way of figuring things out. I repeat, action is not done after we figure things out. Action is how we figure things out. And so this is a, a radical change from the way in which normally you have been uh, trained to think about how to deploy yourself and to lead. We have to plan every single step. And once we have the planning place and the milestone set up, then we deploy ourselves. I'm telling you that you have instead to act and then think about what happened and take corrective action and then the start in the action becoming what you want to become. This is, of course, consistent with an outside-in perspective of adult development, which we have discussed before. In other words, you got to change the way you act as a precursor to change the way you think. Because right now you're thinking about yourself in a special way. And of course, you're acting consistently to that way of thinking. I'm asking you to change the way you act. You show up in a meeting, for example, you're the person always asking questions. What happens if you don't? Or you show up in the meeting as the person that is always silent, who never ask a question or throw or disagree. What happens if you were to do it one time? What are you learning about yourself? I'm not suggesting you to jump in front of incoming traffic. I am suggesting you to simply be more playful with yourself. How can I know what I think until I see what I do? And so the idea here is that in order to internalize a leadership identity and possibly a new leadership identity, you increase your self-knowledge while you're making changes. While you're making changes. Don't wait to change and then you deploy yourself. 
Deploying yourself is a way to change yourself. It's not even fake until you make it. You know, it's do it to learn it so we will not feel fake anymore. Now, what is it in, in two words, my recommendation? Don't just be yourself. You hear this all the time. Just be yourself. I'm asking you to be much more than yourself. You know who you are, but I want you to deploy yourself differently. And that is a very different way to, to think about leadership and to think about what deploying yourself means. And you know, if you need to realize about what, in which area are we really deploying ourselves, well, this is very straightforward. There is the present, where we're living today. There is the future that will come tomorrow. And there is the past. And the truth is, in each of those three domains, we have to ask ourselves an important question. In the past, we need to start thinking what's expandable. In the present, we want to ask what's essential. And in the past, in the future, we want to ask what's emerging. And out of this, we have different kind of work that happen with ourselves and with our organization. Because of course, you can apply this framework to yourself. You can apply this framework to a country. You can apply this framework to a team, to an organization, to all sorts of, in your practice, in your skill, in a lot of different area. We need to learn to let go in order to make space for the future. And that means pause, something we are doing. That means letting go, happily kissing goodbye to something we are doing. Or auspice a difficult loss. And this dealing with the past, it's tough work, very tough work. In the present, we need to manage what continue as is, what is still relevant. We need to continue with a slight upgrade because it's still relevant and also continue and guard because it's important to keep. We need to think about the future in terms of experimentation. What is the emerging priority that is worth your focus and investment? What is the problem solving design? How can we deploy creativity and daring? Now, Everything we can characterize in those eight categories, everything in our life. And, and this is a, an incredible tool that reminds us that, and this is another card, the three circles that you have in your deck, which I think is reminding us that the most important element of this work is to deploy yourself with an exclamation point, meaning do it. Don't stay and think too much. Do it and then see what you're learning about yourself. Deploy yourself above the line in a way you can be creative and collaborative and not worried about the losses, but focusing on growth and creativity and learning. And deploy yourself with an adaptable sense of self without thinking that yourself is just fixed and they will never change. With a playful attitude, think more about not identity work, identity play. Think about that work as a way to upgrade your self-protection. And all this work is what will allow you to actually thrive in the new future that is emerging. So the last card that I want to show you in our deck is the next card is the card of the future. Adaptation is not a sprint. And adaptive work produces a list of things to do, things to try, and new and reveal complexity to explore. But here is a few questions that I want you, actually, I wanna challenge your thinking here. Because I know that a lot of you are thinking that change takes time. And so, I want to introduce you my friend, the Tiktalik. This is a, a mud snapper. Uh, it's an animal that 
a fossil animal that lived many many thousands years ago and this animal is supposed to be the the link between fishes and life on earth yes change takes time but there must be a moment in which a fish has walk on earth at one point and the tiktalik is what it did it the tiktalik at one point walked on earth from being a fish so it's true that change takes time but it's also true that change takes an instant and that's the reason why I want you to focus on the present time and possibly take a stab at those questions that are challenging you to explore yourself more deeply. For example, what am I doing when I feel most beautiful? Or who have you been when you have been at your best? Or what is something you believe that almost nobody agrees with you on? I love this one. I absolutely love this one. So what did you enjoy doing at age 10? This is key because normally what we were in childhood is still with us today. What is your one sentence? A sentence that can describe yourself. My one sentence is accent reduction didn't work. Hopefully Johns Hopkins will do, will do better. <laughs> but, you know, what is your one sentence? If you have to describe yourself in one sentence, what are you willing to try to do now? That is really a key question that I would like to ask. And also a question that I ask you, understanding that at the end of our journey together, of our work in this class, deploying yourself, a lot of larger questions are shaping up. What's next for me? If we think about the balcony, the blind spot we are seeing in this card, what's next for me? What's my one leadership question? If we think about complexity, about what leadership is, what is my one leadership question? That question that is so essential to who I am and to who I want to lead when I lead change. And finally, what self-protection is preventing progress today? Am I protecting from what? Am I protecting for what? I want to give you a moment in a breakout room to actually um, we do our uh, five minutes breakout room to actually reflect on what is coming up for you in this moment as we talk, as we are getting closer to the end of our class and as we start thinking about what's next. What's next for each of us? So let's try to address this question. <laughs> what's next for for each of us let's address this question let's start the breakout room and i will see you on the other side we close our our four session series uh tonight i brought you the voice of art the voice of poetry and I want to share with you this poem of David White, which I think is particularly relevant for the work that all of you do, you're doing. It's called Start Close In. Start Close In. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up the other people's question. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes a private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. 
Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in. The step you don't want to take. It has been an incredible honor to be your lecturer, professor, or teacher, or friend for this class. I know that we have put a lot of meat on the fire. And that is what this session has attempted to do, to try to, in a sense, provoke your way of thinking so that you can more productively and effectively deploy yourself for the sake of your own leadership purpose. What I hope is that you will take into account the invitation from David White to actually take this class and jump into it with both feet. Especially if you consider that of the many topic that we have discussed in those four weeks, I think that the most important topic is that card that is missing. And that is actually the work that is going to happen for you now. I wanna thank you for four weeks of hard work and I would be happy to take your question. The short answer is that I, I, I uh, it, everything starts with a sense of empathy. And so I would say that rather than a rational answer, and you know, empathy is very different from sympathy. Uh, so often in challenging circumstances, people don't know what to say. And so they jump into this expression of sympathy, which is you are in trouble, I am perfectly fine. I'm very sorry for you and, you know, empathy is a little different. So I would say that in a situation like when somebody's stuck, my first reaction is more an empathic reaction, not a problem solving reaction, not a let me give you a solution kind of reaction. And I have noticed that when I do not have a solution, but my response is empathic, mm -hmm. for some reason that helps. This is an observation, it's not, you know, uh, but you know, uh, you can try it with, uh, in many situations. If now the issue is, are you the kind of person that normally is empathic? And you know, here is a challenge maybe to show up as empathic above the line and try to see what happened. How can you connect to that part of yourself that might be empathic? that in your life has expressed empathy, even if you think for yourself that you don't have empathy. So that's what I'm trying to say. I would say that the answer here is an empathic response is number one. And the second, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know the, the reality. I don't know if you are working in a setting in which you're aware of the situation, but you know, um, as usually, what I do is rather than provide answer, I think it's better to provide questions like what's in your mind, you know, and uh, what is hard for you in this situation. Uh, so my response is not the, the kind of traditional problem solving response, it's more an empathic response. And then it's maybe try to move a level of inquiry, but not inquiry for you, so you know all the data and information of why the person, but you know inquiry for them. Um, Sometimes problem solving is the worst thing that we can do in in some situation, because people that's not what they require, or not what they want. Because you know. Uh, again, you know, uh, it's, it's about helping somebody dealing with uh, whatever losses. I mean, I don't know if it's ever happened to you <laughs> in your life, but if, if a friend of mine loses a parent or a relative, you know, I don't tend to call and try to comfort them. I say simply, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you, know? you know, and I think that that is an example of, of what I mean. You know, it's, you know, the truth is, I, I don't know what to say, but I'm here with you. 
you know, yeah. and that, that's it. That is, in some situation, the the most helpful, and definitely the the one that is most honest. I would say because often in many situations in life we don't have an answer. But all what we have is each other. Thank you, Catherine. A pleasure to have you here. Any question I can answer? TJ, I hope this was answer for you. Yeah, so I miss you all, of course. This has been great. I had great fun. Don't be a stranger. Uh, keep in touch. I will send you the slide with my email address. And I hope maybe one day we can work uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, your immunity to change, which is really an incredible, incredible tool, which is there is an article linked on the PowerPoint if you want to know more about the immunity to change. Thank you again. I want to thank Hopkins at home that made this possible. And I want to thank all of you for the incredible attention, focus, and real commitment to growth and change that you have demonstrated to stick with me for four days from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday, on a beautiful Wednesday. I'm really honored of your commitment and I, I wish to hear about your successes. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Joel. A real pleasure.